Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to Mediation and Beyond. Um, today, I have the good fortune of having my friend and colleague, um, Dr. Norman Klein. Um, Norman has been a um, forensic psycho clinical and forensic psychologist for more than 30 years. He's published in, in textbooks, he's published in peer-reviewed articles, and he is a board-certified clinical psychologist and a board-certified forensic psychologist. He's also taught at major universities. And one of the things that Norman does really well is teach. And so that's why I thought bringing him on today to speak to uh, what's it really like in divorce court if you happen to be contemplating it, um, wondering um, rather than just uh, mediating out a divorce or doing a collaborative divorce. But if you're going to get into litigation, um, he's testified in courtrooms, many courtrooms, on behalf of both the plaintiff and defendant. And so we're going to hear from Norman today about what that's really like in divorce court, as well as the expectations that people have once they get into that lane, um, if you will, um, of being in um, a courtroom, um, arguing over um, whether it be assets or child custody or whatever the case may be. So Norman, thank you for coming on today. I very much appreciate it. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, and it's good to see you again. It's been a while. Norman and I are um, <coughs> colleagues in the same building, and since we haven't seen each other too much since COVID, and so it's nice to actually see him. Um, so, Norman, you heard my introduction. I want to just really uh, address what it's like in divorce court for people who don't know and who might be contemplating or might even be in the middle of it. And, um, you know, you can always turn it around, you know, put it in reverse and change it so that they don't end up going to trial and um, whatnot. And actually, right now with COVID, it's being on a litigation lane is going to take a little longer, uh, obviously, than if someone was mediating, mediating a divorce or doing a collaborative. Um, so can you speak to um, kind of you've been in there, you've been in the trenches, what that's really like for people? Well, OK, yes. Um, and I'm, I'm going to just assume that the people tuning in are um, neophytes about this because everyone who goes through this troubling episode in their lives um, discover that it's a unique um, turbulence to them and it's, it's very disturbing, especially if you have children. And so let's just say that um, um, from from the beginning, and, and I've mentioned this before in, in other um, uh, broadcasts that you've had, no, it never, one's intention ought to be never go to court unless you really, really have to. Uh, that being said, family court, which by the way is, is a uh, state jurisdiction, there's no such thing as a federal family court. So the, the highest dis the decider is, is state court because all the states have, have different, each jurisdiction has, has uh, different statutes, et cetera. So you never want to go to court unless you have to. Um, obviously, if you're going to finalize a divorce, you, that has to be done in a, in a family court. Um, so that the best option, of course, is to bring to the court um, uh, as much uncontested business as you can. Now, if the, it's very rare for there to be an entirely uncontested divorce. There's always a small slice of the pie that um, requires some kind of adjudication where the parties are battling. Um, the court is not interested in the stuff that's agreed upon. The court is only interested in arbitrating the stuff that's, uh, uh, th that's in contention. Um, <clears throat> so I don't have to, those of you who are <laughs> tuning in now, listening to this, um, once you're immersed in it, um, you understand that this is very unhappy, very ugly, very, um, um, disturbing uh, business. It's fraught with um, your, one's own emotional and personal um, um, and historical uh, investments in the relationship. And it's my experience is that this small slice that gets brought into court, it's a, not only about winning, 
It's about making the other person wrong. It's about punishing the other person. And that's where the, that is the, that's the, the genesis of the ugliness about this stuff, because it's not just family court, divorce court in particular. I mean, family court, keep in mind, family court can be involved with things other than divorce, can be involved with uh, adoption, parental custody, guardianship, uh, grandparents' rights, um, visitation rights. So it's not just limited to, uh, and God help us, cloning one day. It's not just limited to um, divorce. But, um, but I don't, Lauren, uh, do you think yeah. that what I just heard you say, you know, that if they the uh, it's about punish the other one party punishing another party? But don't you think? I don't even think a, a party would think that they're punishing someone they're more that they're right i find that a lot of people think well i'm not giving up my position of being right you know that's a great observation and i think and my immediate association is i mean the couples that i see that are arguing in my own fuck you fuck you fuck you what what they're doing is trying to use you and i colleen as a referee to make us right and the other one wrong, to make one party right and the other one wrong. And they're using this as a battlefield in order to act that out. And I think that divorce court is the ultimate um, um, uh, nth degree of uh, fighting that out where you're gonna get someone who's going to wag her finger and say, you're right and you're wrong. That's, so, I mean, this it, marriage and, and is, is, is just pure human enterprise. And when you're involved in human enterprise uh -huh. and there's, um, uh, and there are um, disputes in play that don't get addressed that don't get communicated about, that fester then and, and grow and explode. I think that's really largely what um, results in divorce. And then the parties, these human beings are left with um, trying to vindicate their position. And that's what gets played out. And so that's what, what you do is so valuable because you bring to the table, and this is what I want to say. My first statement was never go to court unless you have to. Of course, you have to go to court to settle a divorce. There are different strata that you can go to court. There can be an uncontested divorce. That's the most ideal. Uh, then there can be um, a partially uh, contested divorce where there's a small piece, but then there can be, you know, just all out warfare. Um, and that serves nobody's purpose because lawyers who get many hundreds of dollars an hour to uh, make you right and your partner wrong and to wound your partner, et cetera, et cetera, because, it's, because of, uh, of the, the, the human factor involved, um, that is... Um, um, counterproductive and the carcass of whatever the marital estate that's left over isn't worth picking over. So if there were a mechanism, and there is, and that is you and people who do what you do, is to bring to the court the attorneys who represent you vis-a-vis -vis the judge um, a reasonable, agreed-upon pact where you have isolated the stuff that you have, okay, grudgingly agreed to because you know um, that realistically there's going to be impasses and you're not going, you have to pick your battles and you're not going to pick your battle over grandma's break front kind of thing. You're going to pick your battle over uh, things that are much more important and, and singularly um, the 800 pound gorilla in a uh, divorce court, the, the most important um, argument that, that gets adversarial and ugly is custody. And we can talk about that separately. We're, we're talking uh, generically now and generally now, uh, custody is a whole separate thing and changes the landscape in a lot of important ways. Um, well, typically that's why people end up in divorce 
in, in litigating. Typically, custody, I think, is one of the, the larger uh, areas where people disagree than pretty much any, that. And obviously, finances are the two bigger things in, right. in, in, in divorce court. But custody tends to be a, a huge issue about, um, you know, one, like, I'm just being a little sexist, perhaps a little generic, but, you know, mom's been raising the kids and what. And dad wants to now have more time or 50% of the time. And mom's like, well, you didn't take care of them when we were married. Why are you going to go take care of them now? Like, and so um, and I think that can be a, a, a driving factor or thinking that he drank too much during or she drank too much during the marriage. And now that we're divorcing, it's going to be the same or, you know, because one day you wake up and that parent's no longer a good parent. Right. And that's that's the argument. Once you formalize um, an action to divorce, to literally divide and split apart, once you formalize that in a court of law, which is ultimately adversarial, the most important salient salient um, um, variable is persuasion. You're you believe in your heart and soul, you're right. Um, your partner believes in his or her heart and soul, they're right. Yeah. Um, and so to the extent that you argue about that, you anger builds. And it's up to the, the judge to make some, as, as objective, and this is all subjective, but to make as least subjective in a, uh, a decision as the judge can make, has to base it on the persuasive evidence. That comes down to persuasion, which comes down to the theater of court, which comes down to the talent of the attorney and the guile of the participants. And that's also your, 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 your job, right? I mean, that's you're right. in there for that's testifying right. on either the plaintiff or the defendant side, whoever brought that's the exactly act, right? right? So you're on there supporting kind of the outcome that they're looking for, if you obviously honestly believe that that's a truer outcome. That's a, very, that's a very good qualification. I'm not in there to win for one side or the other. I'm in there to argue my opinion. Okay. And the lawyers, the, uh, typically the way that it works is, um, if it's, a, if it's a divorce case that requires a forensic psychologist, and that's almost always when it comes to custody, unless there are some mental health fitness questions about, um, you know, a competency to manage your own affairs. But let's leave that aside. That's, that's not our audience. Yeah. Um, um, it, so it's parental fitness. And I get called in when, at what interface is, is there the most um, contention? custody and so the attorney who approaches me says look i have this custody case i want you to evaluate it and then you give me your opinion etc 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 so i'll do some kind of preliminary thing and i'll give them a verbal opinion why only a verbal opinion because verbal opinions are not discoverable because i'm going to tell that attorney okay this is my general opinion this is what i can defend and then i'll go ahead and explore it more deeply if the attorney says no nah, nah, i can't use that Goodbye, pays me for my time, and good luck. And he'll find, or she'll find, someone whose opinion is more aligned to persuading from her point of view. When the smoke clears, what you, what you have is, if it goes this far, if it actually goes to trial, and very often things get settled before trial, because that's in everybody's best interest, uh, especially the work that you do tries to promote that, foster that. Mm -hmm. Uh, but if it goes to trial, you're going to have a shrink on one side saying black and a shrink on the other side saying white. And um, it's going to be, come down to whose evidence is most persuasive. And, and that comes down to the theatrical presentation in court. You know, it's... Um, Never send a young forensic psychologist to court. You need someone to have made as many mistakes as I've made over the years <laughs> who has learned stuff and learned how to talk and to whom to talk and what to say. The theater of it, that's what people don't understand. You think that going into court, oh, I'm right and she's wrong and she's an adulteress and he's a drug addict and he's got arrested and she's... 
didn't sign her kids up for school. No, the facts, and this is what's so frustrating, and this is what's so angering, and this is a lot of your work too the, on the clinical side, is how do you get people to accept, live with, and move on from how unfair this shit is? But in the court of law, that's the battlefield, and there's only one ethic on a battlefield, and that's when. And, so, and that's the stand. And I'm that's the ugliness of, which right. is why I retreat to use you, so that what you're bringing to court is only a small, minuscule slice of the, the pie. Yeah. No. And I mean, like, for what I do, trying to get people more to mediate and to come to, to come to an agreement where really no one wins, because it's not really about winning. It's about okay, that worked out for the best of both of us as best it could be. But I don't, definitely don't think it's about when you're trying to mediate or I'm doing a mediation, it is not about who's going to win. No one wins. And, and, and you, need, you need to convince them up front that the definition of a great compromise is it results in nobody's happy. If, right. you're, if somebody's happy, it wasn't, it, it wasn't fair. Yeah, and I think that you have to, at the end of the day, your own standard, right, is, okay, I did the best I could. It wasn't 100% what I wanted, but it wasn't 100% of what I didn't want. So there's, a, there's that middle ground, but what you do and where couples are headed who kind of dig in their heels, um, Dr. Phil, you know, from the Dr. Phil show, calls them right fighters, where you're so entrenched in being right. Oh, right fighters. Right, right. You know, I'm so intent and in, intent on being right that the I've lost, is, I've no, lost but the, scope. But the corollary is in, in a divorce court, your, in, your intent to fight for right is secondary to making the other guy wrong. That's the real emotional um, power engine behind what you just want someone to go. You, you're right, and she, he's wrong. I told you so. <laughs> right? right. That's I right. Told you so. I told you so. <laughs> right. And so you're, the expectation of entering in that, that lane of going into litigation for whatever, if it's a financial or a custody thing, the inherent expectation is that they're going to come, if, if the court listens to me like they should, then I will come out with what I want. And that's not necessarily how it plays out. It is really Russian roulette. That's right. And I think, listen, divorce is um, in most people's lives a very unique uh, experience. And so they have no grounds for understanding um, an accurate reality. So each party goes into it with an expectation. And I can tell you, and I'm sure you can tell people from our clinical experiences, the bigger the gap between expectation and reality, the more suffering. And so part of our job as clinicians with couples who are, who are hurling towards um, some profound disconnect is to course correct their expectations about what's reasonable, their assumptions which may be uh, misguided, um, to the extent that we can attenuate those two things, to narrow the gap between expectation and, and, and reality, the less suffering. But you're right to point out when people go into this, they expect to be, they expect fairness, justice, justice in a court of law, give me a break justice, fairness, um, that because they're right or because they're innocent, um, they're going to be set free. Um, that does not map one-to-one -one with reality. And so that's where a lot of, you know, you sit around, uh, you sit around um, newly divorced at a cocktail bar um, complaining about how the courts suck and lawyers suck and I got screwed, but so is your partner saying the same thing. Um, it's, it's the, rea 
it's one trial learning. Divorce is one trial learning, and, and you need to understand. What do you uh, mean by that? Um, you're not going to get divorced too many times in your life, and if you're if you're lucky, you get you never get divorced. If you're um, mostly lucky, you get divorced only once. And so, whatever you learn about whatever you, whatever you learn that allows you to collapse the expectation and realities to narrow that gap has to be learned in this one episode, this one very prolonged um, um, piece of your history. Um, so you're going into it very naive and, and your attorney is invested in encouraging you for whatever reasons um, uh, and making you right and patting you on the head and comforting you, but attorneys aren't shrinks. And by the way, whatever I'm saying here, everybody needs to understand, I'm not an attorney, I can't give legal advice. So whatever I'm saying comes from the clinical and forensic psychological sphere. Um, so they're they're patting you on the head and in a way encouraging, not dispelling um, your assumptions or your expectations. Um, and when the court or reality or the other, other attorney kicks you in the stomach, you're gobsmacked about that. Oh my God, this is so unfair. No, come on. That's the job. Don't, don't, Get divorced unless you have to. Don't go to court unless you have to. And if you have to, understand you're not going to be happy no matter what. No one's going to be happy. No. no. We haven't even talked about custody. Well, that is something I want to get into because I think that's a, that's a, a big element of at least what I see. Um, and quote unquote, I'm fighting for my children because I want it to be, I think this is how it should be. And you have, you know, if, if, if you guys agreed on everything, then you wouldn't be getting divorced to begin with. Um, but I think, you know, the co-parenting, to me, is it's not even in a divorce term. You should be co-parenting when you're married. Like, it, you're parenting, right? And so whether that marriage doesn't work out doesn't mean that the father or the mother then divorces the children. That's a very good point. That's a very important distinction. Those are two separate roles you have. Uh, spouse is, uh, I mean, the Venn diagram of spouse and parent, they do intersect in important ways. And they're separate in very important ways. Yeah. yeah. I mean, a father's going to have a relationship with his children, even if he's married, the whole time that, the, that's his own relationship. But like, I, my parents are still alive. Both of them, I have completely different relationships with each of them. They're still married. They're still alive. But if they were divorced, I'd still have completely different relationships with both of them. Like it's really the marital piece is not why I have the relationship with them. I have a relationship with them because they're my parents. Right. That's the, that's the and, separate part of the Venn diagram. Right. But, the, right. but in divorce, it's very hard, I find, for either party sometimes to separate out spouse from parent. Because those emotions get in the way. And they get delivered to this cauldron. This, the divorce is a cauldron of bubbling everything where all the roles and variables are, are uh, you know, get blended, percolated together. Um, and so that's not the place it's supposed to get separated out until and unless it comes to custody evaluation. That's and what are whole, some of the things that they look for when you're talking about custody evaluation. So if I mediate, we recreate, I mean, my first thing I do is a parenting plan. It is the most important piece of unraveling the family and creating a different dynamic for them. So that parenting piece is super important to me, very detailed. But when you go down a litigious route, what is that standard that you're, the evaluative standard that you're you know, looking at? Okay, well, just briefly historically, um, let, let's. <laughs> uh, the, 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 uh, I'm online here. Um, briefly historically, the first case that um, I don't know uh, ever, ever crossed my awareness about um, um, a court judging. Um, parental fitness was King Solomon. You, you maybe, you know, you know this from the Bible where these two women come to King Solomon. I mean, you, they, don't, they call King Solomon, 
the, the, the adjective uh, Solomon-like has to do with wisdom, and this is based on this case. Uh, two, two women come to, come to Solomon, one's crazy, one is the mother of an infant, and the two women are disputing who, whose child that is. And so Solomon um, d does whatever he does, and one woman says, uh, so Solomon listens, and um, his um, verdict is, okay, we'll split the baby in half. And one woman says, fine, I'll take the half child. And the other woman says, oh, no, you can't do that to my baby. You can't. And, and so Solomon, of course, awarded the baby to the most fit parent. So that was the first case. Um, yes. so <laughs> I never thought of it that way, but yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, but that was the first case. Um, fast forward to medieval times where women, uh, where children were property, Women couldn't own property, and so all custody rights were automatically granted to men. Fast forward from that to the 1880s, where uh, English common law um, introduced this idea that the tender years doctrine yep. um, of children then uh, swayed courts of law to give custody automatically to the mother unless proved unfit. Fast forward to that to 1910s, first women's movement, where they're looking for equality. Children now, there are, la there are labor laws, children now have their own rights, and now it starts to get very cloudy. Move on to the 70s, where there, the women's movement establishes real equality, and now for the first time, family courts and divorce courts come face-to-face, -face abutting questions of custody, because it's, it's assumed that um, uh, that both parents are fit, uh, not because the children is property and not because of tender years, they both have equal claim. And so what do the courts do then? They retreat to the first preference, which is the parent that was uh, the most uh, involved in caregiving. The, what is it, the um, preferential, what was it again? Let me get the right term. Which was typically the mother, anyways, back at, That's at, right. at that stage, right. the, the care, the home care, homemaker. Right. The the um, um, the primary caretaker preference. Gotcha. So whichever one that is, and you're right, it's it's usually the mother. That's what the court is leaning towards. Um, um, absent that or questions of fitness that uh, contaminate that question, then the next one is joint custody. And they start, and, and this goes to one of the questions in our last session, they, judges try to start at 50-50 until and unless um, there is evidence to show that it ought to be otherwise. Uh, what is that evidence? That's where forensic psychologists get called in. In custody evaluations, that's the meat and potatoes of a, of a psychologist vis-a-vis uh, -vis a courtroom. Um, so what is that evidence? For like, okay. if I'm a stay-at-home mom, I have my kids, and we're getting divorced, I would assume I'm still just going to have the role I've had as mother. And that, But if my ex wants to change his job position or he can work at home more or things like that, and he wants more custody of the kids, but he's never had it. Is that a standard by which? It, it can be, and this is important, and it's very frustrating to people. Um, family courts take these things on a case-by-case -case mm -hmm. basis. We ha I mean, we have to take a look at the individuals, their, um, their, um, their emotional stability, their occupational stability, their um, um, physical uh, uh, abilities, um, and then they start to, it starts to influence the scales from 50-50 to otherwise. And so um, while joint custody uh, uh, ideally would be 50-50, and that's fraught with its own problems, we can get into that. Um, it gets modified and calibrated based on the strengths and weaknesses of the parents. How is that, um, how, how is that um, um, evaluated, you ask? Um, well, you go to a forensic psychologist and over months and many thousands of dollars a person needs to understand 
Um, there are clinical interviews. What's a clinical interview? I talk to you. I, I try to elicit a social history, family history, educational history, criminal history, et cetera, et cetera, from each parent. Um, I do the same with each child. Then, if I'm assigned by the court, instead you of- You interview the children? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Is there a certain age where you wouldn't interview? That, that's an excellent question. I am bound by declaring up front what I'm competent to do and what I'm not competent to do. And if you still go ahead and assign me to do this and I don't know how to talk to a four-year-old, I have to find someone who does and I will fold into my report that person's um, evaluation. So you see how this can be uh, very expensive. Layered. Oh, and very expensive. Okay, uh, so, and that's just the clinical part. Um, if I'm if I'm assigned by the court to do this and not by an individual attorney, I have a right to talk to, interview, examine, read the records of pediatricians, police, teachers, nannies, family. I get to talk to everybody. Why? Because the judge needs as much evidence to make this judgment about what is the best environment for the development of a child uh, that they can. And as I emphasized in the past, the this is all subjective. And this is just a great guess by the judge. And it's only the judge that does. I can't, uh, we shrinks don't decide, we advise. And we defend our opinion as persuasively as possible. So, okay, so, and that's just the interview. Then there's testing. It's like batteries of tests, days and days of tests. Um, uh, the parents and the children, intellectual capacities, um, um, emotional deficits, uh, psych uh, psychopathologies. Um, is the patient lying? Uh, you know, what are the vulnerabilities and strengths kind of thing? Um, and that goes into a report. And then finally, and uh, I think most saliently, um, you, one does uh, unobtrusive naturalistic observation of the parents with the children, each parent along with the child and you unobtrusively observing and the parents together, parenting together, that kind of thing. And so, and then if I'm experienced enough to uh, digest and make understandable my um, observations and, and opinions, um, I write a report. And so does the other side. So the other side is doing the exact same thing that you're doing. If they can afford it and uh, yeah. it's not uncommon, at least in Connecticut, my experience is for the court to order it and neither side contests it. They just, ex they just debate about that one singular report. But if it were I, um, I'm yeah. getting my own shrink because I have to tell you, just as um, there are two sides to each objective story, there's three sides to every subjective story. And there's nothing, psychology is not um, physics. Right. So, right. Psychology, um, uh, we like to represent ourselves as behavioral scientists, but we're as much artists as we are scientists if, and, or, and all that that means. You know, I want to ask a question here and it's kind of a little aside, but I think it's relevant. The only people who really can fight, I would, it sounds like, are the people who can afford it. Did I miss something? <laughs> Come on, absolutely right. right. So we're not I mean, gonna see, we're not gonna see people who are, you know, just getting by paycheck to paycheck, which is a lot of people. Well, that's, uh, the, that's one of the great, um, it's one of the, I was going to say tragedies, but it, it, that's too strong a word. It's one of the great shortcomings of our system, whether it's family court, criminal court, civil court, you get the justice you can pay for. It's, um, that's a great, that's just sentence. The truth. That's a great sentence. Yeah. That's, that, that's just the reality of things, which, is, and, and, you know, and I said last time, and it sounded um, glib, I said, never go to court, even for jaywalking without an attorney. Yes. And I thought after I said that, you know, that's really um, insensitive because some of the people that I see can't who, who, who 
who mm -hmm. need to be separate from an abusive husband, for example, or, or a neglectful uh, parent, um, can't afford an attorney, um, what do they do? And, and giving it some thought, I have a little advice. I don't know how useful it is. I would do one of two things. I would go to the, if you're in Connecticut or whatever state you're in, go to the state bar association because lawyers are, I think, required, if not required, strongly encouraged to do pro bono work. And so there must be panels of matrimonial attorneys that with, with firms that have a... Uh, pro bono uh, debt to pay kind of thing. So I wonder if there's a list where you can do that. If short of that, um, if you're contemplating divorce or you're at some impasse or crossroads within the, within the process, you don't have to retain a matrimonial, matrimonial attorney for divorce, which is fifteen, twenty thousand dollars just for retainer, buy an hour of their time, three, four hundred dollars, to get some advice and guidance. So that if you have to go in and make some kind of statement in court by yourself and yeah. don't do that ever if you don't have to. But if you have to, go armed with the advice that you bought for an hour's time with a matrimonial attorney. And then you'll be better informed about how to access the system in your behalf as efficiently and affordably as you can. It's, 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 it sounds, that even that sounds ideal and there are people who can't do it, but hey, let's deal with the reality here. Well, I do know in some of the courthouses, you know, here, we're in Connecticut, um, that you can go in and get some free legal advice right in the courthouse. I think I it, didn't know that. Yeah, it's one day a week, I believe, like down oh. in Stanford, we can get, so, and the clerk's offices, I have to say, are super helpful. No kidding. They're loaded with information. Um, so I think even accessing your local family court, you know, to, to if, if you're contemplating divorce or trying to get information, I always think knowledge is power, right? If you're just trying to collect your information and how to go about things, given your situation, like you were saying, you know, no, it's not cookie cutter. No two families are ever the same. No two divorces are ever the same. And so I think just trying to empower yourself with, with knowledge I and, think and, and then make a decision. Yeah, I think that that's really good. And, and if it is been, domestic violence, you can go to your local domestic violence. Well, that's a whole, yes, that's a whole. Right, that's case. what I'm just saying, and get I, information on how to strategically go about that in a smart and safe way. So, um, but yeah, so those are good points. But when you were speaking, it really struck me that the only way, and not that it's a bad thing that if people are need to argue and need, they're sticking to their guns and they're right, that they're going to hire who they need to hire, whether they have to sell their home or you know, get rid of all their money, whatever they need to do, they're going to hire people because one side or the other will not, uh, you know, negotiate it out and mediate it out. But I was thinking that sometimes families don't have that option. They don't. And so that's... Um, well, the, the family court does operate with uh, a sense of, uh, it's a legal and... and, and um, ancient uh, English common law concept called parents patriae, which is that the comes from the idea that the king is the benevolent overlord of um, his or queen's subjects. Um, but the modern translation has to do with that the courts are the caretakers of and the benevolent um, overseers and judges of what's the best interest of the parties before them. And when that comes to children, that's where the idea of best interest of the child is born from, this idea that the courts, that the, that the government um, is the good parent in all of this. And to the extent that you can make that appeal in some formal or, or statute driven way, I think there, there are options for that. Um, um, in family court, um, everything boils down to the best interests of the children. Which is subjective, correct? Oh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, w one of the things that we behavioral scientists have uncovered a long time ago through research is that that best interest of the child is, 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 is terribly 
misnamed that if we had used um, least detrimental alternative, that's way more measurable, way more objective, and much more helpful to the trier of fact, i.e. a judge in a family court. That's a great um, term. I'm not, yeah. it's a great term. Well, it's, yeah, it's, that's what the research points to in a way to obviate the impact of best interest of the child, which is an idealized thing passed down from the tender years project uh, um, the tender years um, pr preference from years ago. Um, it's not practical, it's not achievable, and it's not definable. Best um, interest you're talking yeah, about, right? Yeah. So least detrimental alternative already assumes that this, you know, if, it's before a, a, if custody is before a judge, it's fucked up already. And so how do we um, do the least damage to the development of a child, and that's much mm -hmm. more realistic and much more palatable an outcome. Yeah, you're a terrible parent, and you're a terrible parent, but you can handle the homework better and are more nurturing. You have more money, but you are cold and, and detached. You know, um, gotcha. the, the judge will decide least detrimental alternative is what they're really charged to do, even though they don't know that that's what they're doing. That's, uh, the, the law takes a long time to catch up with science. Is there, um, are they, is there a shift in that, Norman, to get away from the uh, best interest of the child standard and move into least de detrimental alternative? When I testify, there is, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, and, and everybody understands that. Um, but I don't see it in the literature too much. It is the literature is overwhelmed by the term best interest of the child and lawyers lecture on it and judges um, uh, pontificate from the bench about best interest of the child as if that rubric is the gold standard when everybody really knows that it's least detrimental alternative. You know, you know what I'm thinking when you're speaking, I'm like, well, the, if two parents are in court arguing, both are saying, I have the best interest of the child standard. I, oh no, I have the best interest of the child standard. And then the judge comes down and says, hold it. I have the best interest of the child standard and this is what we're doing. And the other two people who thought they were right, again, in the best interest, um, it sometimes can get blown out of the water because sometimes you don't get either side. The judge can make a blend of that, can well, do whatever they want. Like we're dancing around uh, um, another variable here that you know well about, and that's the guardian ad litem. Oh, yeah. The, the person charged by the court to represent the best interests of the child. And um, that's a whole other story, isn't it? It is, because I gave a presentation at the State House in January, and one of my things about guardian ad litems, the attorney for the child, is that that's an attorney for the child. You know, if you're lucky, you know about, you should ask for to have a mental health worker. Because I think if you're really looking at what's in the best interest of the child, yes, legal stuff is important, but it's that mental health of whatever home environment. Because you may have two toxic parents. Or well, maybe the person that is charged with, charged with being in touch with me and collaborating with me mm -hmm. about my findings and opinions, as well as any other um, a forensic uh, psychologist involved in a case. And so they, they, uh, the good ones understand that their limits are representing the child in court, which has to do with their legal rights, but that, but that um, um, the, the, the valence with which they represent them has to do with what they get from the uh, people who are doing the uh, psychological assessments. Right. Um, so that's their job. And, and there's a whole range of talent among guardian ad litem, uh, I have found. There are good ones and a lot of not good ones. And that's only, guardian ad litems declare they're only appointed if people are not agreeing, right? I mean, no, children do not have a guardian ad litem otherwise if you can get two parents to uh mediate negotiate collaborate come together you don't have all these other extraneous people yeah i don't know what the co courtroom uh rules are but i suspect either attorney can re 
request it. I don't, yes. I don't know how that works, but either attorney um, can request it, and then both attorney, you know, both sides can agree, or the judge will appoint. I've been involved in cases where the guardian ad litem got challenged, but that's very long-winded and hard and expensive. And but everything in a court of law is challengeable. Everything in a court of law is about what is the truth today. Tomorrow it could be very different. Uh, how persuasive can I be now that the Klieg lights are on and a decision is to be made? That's the only. That's the only uh, salient, pivotal moment. Because the same facts and the same principles and the same players on another day can get an entirely different decision. So it all comes down to the theater and persuasion and amassing evidence, which in divorce court is extensive, long, months long, tens of thousands of dollars. Well, sometimes years long. Yeah, that's I mean, right. Sometimes that's years. Right. I wish it, it was sometimes, I wish it was months, but a lot of times you'll see people, t they've been in the system two, three years. Well, wars, it out. warfare, I've, uh, you know, there's been, there have been six day wars and there have been 15 year wars. Right. And so, and if you were going to, you know, if someone's watching this at midnight, just, you know, flipping through YouTube, they're watching this conversation. I mean, to sum it up, you would say what to somebody either in the process already or someone contemplating divorce? Like what would you, what, would, what advice after having been in the trenches yourself? I would encourage them to understand that they're not alone. I would encourage them to be aware of, even though they can't, they can't at least in the beginning, attenuate um, their anger and fear and all and the way that that reigns over there that 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 um um, um controls what they think and feel i would encourage them to get clear that this isn't going to work out i'm at a crossroads very important decisions have to be made i need to bring in people who are professionals at making the, at uh, representing me, be that um, a psychologist, a mediator, um, an attorney, and you don't have to sign up for the whole ride. You're, you're in the throes of making a decision, mm -hmm. and so how do you make a decision uh, against the backdrop of pure raw? Uh, a disturbing emotion, anger and fear usually. Um, how do you make that? Well, you take a deep breath, you understand you have a decision to make, um, and you gather evidence, you gather information, you find out what your options are and what is realistic and what isn't realistic, and then you decide to go forward or not, or how to go forward. So my best advice is to understand you're not alone, um, call a therapist if you're being racked by indecision and emotion and you have, and, and you have no handle on uh, what's going on or where this is headed um, and get, get some guidance there. If you're already clear that there is a dissolution of the marriage uh, ahead, then you consult an attorney, not retain them yet but buy an hour or two of their time to find out what I have a decision to make. What do I need to know? What are the pros and cons of this decision? Um, that's my which best. Doesn't, which doesn't mean you have to use that attorney going forward, but no. it is just knowledge is power. And if you have a therapist, I would say get somebody who knows uh, divorce court, who's, yes. who understands Absolutely. divorce, not there just any therapist. There are therapists like yourself who do who do clinical work purely and also do mediation um, at, the, at that interface, that would be somebody ideal to find. And I'm sure that's find outable online these days. Oh, it is. But that's what I, if you're looking for a, a therapist or someone, go to somebody who, uh, who knows or, or go see a mediator or an attorney, like you said, but who's in that field, just don't go see anybody. But um, well, thank you, Norman. Like I can go on and on and I know I'll be bringing you back on. So um, I appreciate it because I, it, it's invaluable for people just to like, you have to figure it out before you go down 
you open that door or go down Absolutely. that lane. And let me and let me let let me offer because um, I, I like to do this. Um, people can be in touch with me on the phone. I don't charge a fee for my phone time. If you wanna, if you're in the throes of something like this and you just want to pick my brain for a little bit, um, just go to my website. That's all the ways you can uh, reach me. And What's your website, Norman? Can you share what, what that is? Yeah, it's normankleinphd.com and Klein is spelled K-L-E-I-N. And so, um, yeah, make me your first stop and we can uh, custom make a, uh, um, a next step kind of thing. Um, and uh, I Great. guess we'll see you in the hall. Yeah, uh, you can contact uh, Norman and I'm right next door to Norman so we can certainly help you out or talk or whatever. But yeah. um, I really appreciate you coming on. If you wanna leave a comment, um, about Norman's talk today, you can leave it on our YouTube. You can leave a comment. You can contact Norman at uh, normankleinphd.com. Oh, yeah. You can contact Colleen O'Neill. You can contact uh, Colleen at colleenoneal.com or Mediation and Beyond, and leave me. Um, you can leave me a comment there. I can certainly get in, get in touch with Norman if you if you need it. And uh, Norman, I thank which, you. Which of the many ways do you spell O'Neill? O n e i l. It actually does have an apostrophe, but technology does not like apostrophes. But um, yeah, O-N-E-I-L, thank you. And um, yeah. I look forward to our, our, our future talks down the road. Yeah, me too. Um, so me too. enjoy the rest of your day. Thank, thank you, everybody, too. for coming on, and um, we'll talk soon. Take care. Bye-bye.